15 years after the Murids rose up in the Caucasus, Russia was still unable to assert its rule in the region. Under the enigmatic leader Imam Shamil, the Murids continued to harass the Tsar's forces with their guerrilla warfare tactics. Despite repeated Russian victories, Imam Shamil was not discouraged. For him and his followers, this was a war to the death, where surrender was not an option. This perseverance would pay off. Having bolstered his forces throughout the first half of the 1840s, Imam Shamil was besieged in his Chechen stronghold of Dargo by a Russian force in 1845. What ensued was the biggest victory for the Murids of the entire war, and served to highlight the military genius of Shamil. This video is brought to you by my wonderful Patreons. Visit my Patreon page to find out how you can support Hikmah History as well. The recent explosion of Murid military action did not go unnoticed in St. Petersburg, and Tsar Nicholas I immediately sent 26 new battalions to the front. In 1844, these battalions managed to push the Murids away from the Caspian Sea, once again containing Imam Shamil off to just his mountains and forests. The following year, even more attention was given to the front as the Tsar appointed General Voronstov as the main commander in the Caucasus. Voronstov was a noble made famous for his success fighting the retreating Napoleon after his failed invasion of Russia in 1812. He would take a more offensive position, so for his first campaign he set his sights on the Chechen stronghold of Dargo. Voronstrov believed that he had found a safer path to the Murid stronghold, but he was dead wrong. The campaign started in May 1845, as the 18,000 strong Russian force led by Voronstov and aided by General Klugenau set off from Fort Vnizafia. The combat would begin to break out when the army entered the forests, but despite this, it went deeper and deeper into the dark woodlands. A week later, the army reached the Terek River. Voronstov set a forward guard of a thousand to camp a few miles upstream from the main force. On that night of June 6th, an out-of-season cold froze the land. The soldiers did not think to bring warm clothes with them, so they scrambled and huddled for warmth around small fires as lighting larger ones might attract unwanted attention. By morning, over 450 of them woke up with frostbitten fingers, toes and noses, whilst 500 horses laid cold and dead where they slept. A bad omen of things to come, the very place was now rejecting the Russian army. In addition to the harsh weather, they were also being ambushed every chance that the Murids got. By this point in the war, the Murids had perfected a number of tactics that best suited their guerrilla warfare strategy. Chief amongst these was the use of horse mountain artillery, or as the Russians refer to it, nomadic artillery. Shamil's Naibs, especially the Chechen Talhig of Shali, had mastered this tactic of shooting at his Russian foes and then quickly moving the artillery on horse-drawn carriages to another location where they would resume firing. When the Russians would rush to the sounds of the artillery, they'd find no guns at the spot. Despite this, Voronstov pushed on. By June 14th, the army finally reached their first checkpoint, the Andy Valley. The lush green valley would allow for the Russians to resupply and stockpile on food and supplies in preparation for the last half of their campaign. There was one problem with this plan however. The Andy Valley had been scorched, all life being burnt out of the landscape by Shamil who had seemingly guessed or known the Russian plan. Voronstov, always the stubborn man, decided to go ahead with his plan regardless. 
attempting to stockpile supplies that the army used before a large surplus could even be built up. After three weeks of waiting in the blackened valley, Voronstov set off to finally capture Dargo. The last push was only 20 kilometers, but the road ahead was nearly single file all the way and crawling with murid forces. Eventually, his men pushed through and reached the outskirts of Dargo a few nights later. With no patience left, he ordered a night attack to take the town. But the town was curiously left sparsely defended. As the Russian advance party walked into the quiet, empty streets, everything erupted in flames as Shamil ordered the burning of his own stronghold. The whole Russian army quickly rushed in. Voronstov thought he had won, except he had only been tricked. Shamil had taken a play straight out of the Russian military book, leaving his town abandoned and the army occupying it isolated and cut off from their supply line. Ironically, this left Voronstov in the same state as the Russian general had left Napoleon in Moscow some 30 years ago. The Russian army was playing right into Shamil's hands. The intrepid Imam stationed a few cannons on a mountainside and started to rain lead on Dargo. To add to the fear, Shamil ordered his drummers to start ominously playing Russian anthems from the cover of the nearby forests. After three days of sitting in Dargo, a supply caravan's flare was finally spotted a few miles away. Voronstov only had food for one day left, so he sent his most experienced general, Klugenau, to secure the much needed supplies. This column set off at dawn, immediately meeting resistance. Whole groups of men were cut off and shot down by murid sharpshooters. The battered Russian force reached the caravan by the evening and turned to go back down the path that so many had just died on that morning. The murid seemed even more numerous now and even targeted the supply train. To make matters worse, a heavy rain fell over the forest. Many of the wagons became stuck in the mud and abandoned by Klugenau, who prioritized the lives of his men over that of the supplies. The dark forest was made even more ominous by the lack of dead Russians from the previous day's march. They were simply nowhere to be found. At one point, the column came across two fallen trees. To the terror of Klugenau, hundreds of dead Russians filled the space in between the trees. The soldiers were then forced to march over their own dead comrades, some joining this mass grave as they went over the top. When the tattered and wounded men under Klugenau arrived back at Dargo, they had lost over 1,000 men and nearly all the supplies. Voronstov then knew how dire his situation really was. Klugenau had brought only two more days worth of food back with him, just enough to escape Dargo. On July 13th, the desperate Russian army made their move to escape the town that had become their prison. The shortest path to freedom was north, one that had not been previously travelled. The army marched through the forest for three days until meeting up with General Freitag, who once again saved the day. During those three days, an additional 1,000 died and 2,000 more were added to the wounded list. When Freitag saw the force, he remarked that there were barely enough men left to carry out the wounded. The total Russian casualties over the three-month-long campaign was 5,000 dead and 3,000 wounded, among them being seven generals. This was by far the biggest murid victory of the whole war. For the rest of 1845, Shamil was more than safe to do what he wished, and he wished to join with his Circassian brethren still in revolt in the west. Thank you guys for watching, remember this is a part of a video series on the Russian conquest of the Caucasus, so expect content on Imam Shamil as well as the Circassians very soon. Before I go, I wanted to ask you something. 
What do you think about me saying the term Kafkaz instead of Caucasus? In the actual region itself and much of the Islamic world, it is known as Kafkaz and for some reason I have trouble saying the English version of it, Caucasus. I think it's the, the end of the word that just trips me up, especially when it's in the middle of a sentence. Kafkaz seems to just roll off the tongue for some reason. Let me know in the comment section below if you'd be cool with me saying Kafkaz from now on. Until next time, peace!